Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. Happy, as always, to have you here with me. So I have done episodes on Wyatt Earp and Dodge City, Billy the Kid, the Jesse James Gang, but there were plenty of other Western American gunfighters, not known as well as the aforementioned ones, but still every bit as interesting. So we are a little overdue, I think, for an interview of that era, uh, of that ilk. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce my guest, G.R. Williamson. He is an author that specializes in the Old West, especially as it relates to Texas history and folklore. Some of his titles include Notorious Gamblers of the Old West and Willis Newton, The Last Texas Outlaw. And the book he is here to tell us about today is called Texas Pistoliers, The True Story of Ben Thompson and King Fisher. Great to have you here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. What is it about this time period in, in Texas that gets you to turn on that computer and, and start writing? Yeah, golly. Uh, normally, I deal in anything uh, before 1900. And uh, when I was a teenager, many, many decades ago, <laughs> Uh, there was a, a local newspaper article on King Fisher in which they moved his coffin from one location to another. And when they did, uh, they pulled out of the ground and uh, King Fisher had a cast iron coffin with, weld, with a welded lid and a glass plate over the head. And they could make out his features and all that sort of stuff. So, it, And then he was moved. Well, that was big news there for a while. Well, as a teenager... That got me interested in King Fisher. Then from there, he was killed with uh, Ben Thompson in uh, San Antonio. So then I studied, did a lot of work on uh, uh, Ben Thompson. So that's how I got started with it. And my interest there is in things that you haven't read about over and over again. I like to do something new. And nobody has written this story before. And what it amounts to is a dual biography of Kingfisher and Ben Thompson. They weren't close friends. They didn't interact a lot throughout their life together. And they only came together on March the 11th, 1884. And then they were killed later on that night, shortly before, or oh, shortly after midnight. So that's what got me interested. So, so let's talk about these men separately, if you don't mind. And we can start first with Ben Thompson, who is probably the more notorious of the two. Would you agree? That is correct. He was. Ben Thompson was a frontier gambler who grew up as a wild kid in Austin. And then uh, he shot his first uh, person when he was 16 there in Austin, but it was uh, another young man, and he just shot him with some bird shot, so it wasn't, he didn't kill him. Later, as an adult, he went to uh, New Orleans, where he worked in a bookbinding store, and during that time, he got into a duel with a prominent Creole there, and they had a knife fight in a ice house. It had no windows. They locked him in to the ice house with each with a dagger. And uh, Thompson walked out alive, and they buried the Creo. Then later on, he, he was a pro proficient gambler at that time, and he went on up to the Kansas, rough Kansas cattle towns and uh, worked the, those cattle towns, starting with Abilene, and he went through several other towns working uh, as a gambler. In Abilene, he and a, his partner, Phil Cole, opened a saloon called the Bull's Head Saloon. And most of the Texas cowboys, when they got their pay at the end of the line, went to the Bull's Head. So it was a congregation for the Texas cattle drovers. 
as it turned out, um, there was a feud going on between Phil Cole and Wild Bill Hickok over the affections of a prostitute named Jesse Hazel. And at one point, there was a big fight, and uh, Wild Bill Hickok, in a drunken rage, kicked and severely beat the woman who was in bed with Phil Cole. Anyway, there was back and forth on that, and then a couple of days later, uh, when Thompson was out of town, uh, Phil Cole was going down the street with some drunken cowboys, and they had to see a dog off the side, and they shot at it. They didn't kill it. They just shot at it. Well, Hickok heard that, and he was standing on in the next street behind where the shot went off. He went through the saloon and out the front door and told Phil Cole that he shouldn't have fired that shot. And then immediately he pulled out two Derringers and shot him cold-blooded there in the street. Phil was able to get off three shots at uh, Hickok, but missed him. Then there was a, a deputy that, come, that came running around to help uh, Hickok, and Hickok, by this time, his vision was going bad to tertiary syphilis, and he wheeled and shot the, the deputy, and he, he died. Uh, so it was a really terrible situation. Anyway, during that time uh, that Ben Thompson was away, he was in a really bad carriage accident, and he went back to Austin to uh, recover. And then later on, he went back up to Kansas, and he was in most of the major cattle towns. Uh, Ellsworth, uh, Kansas, is where he had a shootout with some crooked police, and uh, that didn't turn out too well. And in the process of that shootout, the sheriff there was trying to broker a deal so that everybody would stop shooting. So he went out in the street and talked to Ben Thompson and his brother Billy about let's talk a deal here and they were agreed and they were walking down the street and Billy Thompson who was very drunk managed to shoot the sheriff with a shotgun in, and he died so then after that all kinds of stuff happened and I won't go into the details of all that but then they went on to other cattle towns they wound up in Dodge City, where they came up against uh, Bat Masterson, and uh, anyway, the, they became friends. Bat Masterson and uh, Ben Thompson became friends. Later on, Thompson went to Leadville, Colorado, to tra take on the gambling element there. And while he was working the, the faro tables there, Bat Masterson approached him and said that he needed him to serve with some other Texans in guarding the property of a railroad that ran through Royal Gorge. Thompson agreed to help. And in that was an episode in Wild West history called the Royal Gorge War. And at the end, Thompson was paid off for his services with some diamonds and some cash. He went back to Austin, and using that money, he bought the gambling concession above the Iron Front Saloon, and it was on the second floor, and up there he operated his gambling operation. And then later on, uh, he became the, he was elected, he was elected the city marshal of Austin. Now, he killed a lot of men prior to that, but the people of Austin loved him, and they, they he became the city marshal. During his tenure as the city marshal, the crime rate dropped to an all-time low. In 1882, he went to San Antonio to track down a fugitive, and when he arrived in San Antonio, he went straight to the Jack Harris's vaudeville theater and saloon and had a confrontation there 
and he left. And later on that evening, he approached the saloon, and he was standing out in the street, and Peg Leg Jack Harris, they had a hollering match at each other, and so uh, Harris fired at uh, Thompson, and Thompson drilled him deader than a doornail. Okay, that didn't set too well with the people of San Antonio. And the reason why? Jack Harris was the, he was the leader, the boss of the Democratic Party. And when and every one of the elected officials that had their office, uh, elected to their office, owed it to Jack Harris. Well, Ben Thompson had just killed the political golden goose that had been laying the political gold eggs. And so there was a lot of bad blood about that. Anyway, Thompson was um, tried for that, and he eventually was acquitted. He went back to Austin and operated his uh, gambling joint above the Iron Front Saloon. But he started drinking really heavy, and at this time he would go into some heavy drunken problems where he would shoot up the town, shoot out street lights, shoot out uh, crystal chandeliers and stuff like that. He was, he was becoming a very bad person when he was drunk. When he was sober, he was quite a nice guy to talk to and everything. But unfortunately, he kept drinking a whole lot. So... That was the shape he was in when Kingfisher arrived in Austin on that fatal day in which later on they were murdered in the Vaudeville Theater. So that's a a brief overview of of, uh, Ben Thompson. Yeah, he's a really compelling figure. I can see why you'd want to write a book about him. I'd like to ask you about his earlier life. Um, While he's associated with Texas. He was actually born in England, right? Do we know much about his early background? No, not a lot. Uh, yes, he was born in, in England. And um, he, um, they, well, I, I can tell you a little bit about that. His father was a ne'er-do-well, and they had to leave England and come to Austin to some relatives that lived in Austin. And shortly after he, they got to Austin, his father took off, and they never saw him again. So he was left up to be the leader, the male leader of the family uh, as a teenager. And it was his mother, his brother Billy, and his sister Mary. And he had to take care of them and, and protect them. And then eventually he got into gambling and a bunch of other stuff. But, yes, he was, it was in um, Nottingham, if I remember right, in England. So he, I, I would assume, I would assume that not having heard him talk, that he would have had a slight British accent. And he fought for the Confederate Army. Yes, he did. And, and, he, and he was a Confederate spy, and he did... Uh, a bunch of things in the Civil War. At the same time, he was running a faro game in in the tents, uh, looting his fellow soldiers. And at one point, he was stationed down uh, on the border, and he cleaned out all of the uh, soldiers that were down there. And then he asked the Mexicans on the other side to come over and he cleaned them out, too. Only they didn't take too well to that. And there was a shootout in, in his pharaoh tent. And uh, there were several people killed in there. And then he took off running. And a Mexican with a blunderbuss, I think is what they call it. It was like a big shotgun. Uh, fired at him just as he was hitting the Rio Grande. And... Uh, blew off a piece of his uh, frock, the tailcoat off his frock coat, and then he dived into the water and went across over into Mexico. So, yeah, he was in the Civil War, but he was also making money as a a pharaoh dealer. 
What were the, the circumstances by which Thompson found himself in prison for the first time? Okay, uh, let's see. Let me get that one squared away here. At one point, he was back in Austin, and during Reconstruction, carpetbaggers and a bunch of other people came down in Texas. They treated Texas terribly. And they did a lot of illegal things, and one was they wanted to get him for some murder of some sort, uh, and he, it was strictly a self-defense deal. But anyway, they threw him in prison, and uh, it was a very terrible prison that he was in. But he managed to uh, bribe some guards, and he escaped, and he went back into Mexico. So that was during Reconstruction when the carpetbaggers and the other ne'er-do-wells swarmed into Texas. So for someone who might meet Ben Thompson for the first time, could you give us a description of him, how he would have looked, how he dressed, how he carried himself? Uh, first of all, when you'd meet him, say you met him for the first time on the street or something like that, he was very friendly, uh, very pleasant. He was... Uh, about five foot seven or five feet eight. He was well dressed. He always dressed extremely well and nor- normally had uh, jewelry on, uh, a big diamond ring or, or diamond studded cufflinks and sometimes a, a golden watch bob with diamonds in it. So he, he was very elaborate. <laughs> and the reason for all that was in gambling. It was always that when your luck ran out and you, you ran out of money, you went straight to a pawn shop and hocked your jewelry so you could keep playing. But he was a, a pleasant, uh, fashionable man, and he was a pleasure to meet and talk with. But uh, unfortunately, over the years, the alcohol took over. You describe on the first page of your book what a pistolier is. I think many of us, when we think about guys like this, the words gunfighter, gunslinger are thrown around. What is a pistolier? (laughs) Thank you for asking that. Uh, Sure. I was hoping we could talk about that. During Ben Thompson's and Kingfisher's era, or that time period, there were a number of terms used. Uh, Let's see, shootist, gunman, desperates. that, That was used a lot desperates and pistoliers and the pistoliers basically uh, it, it's a, comes from French and it was basically one who was proficient at pistols and it, at that time it was meant and they were very lethal at it and so that's where that term pistoliers was used at that time It wasn't until shortly before the 1900s that the the term gunfighter came into vogue. So gunfighter was not used in that time period uh, of Thompson and Fisher. It was other terms, but pistoliers was one of those uh, terms. As a side note to the term pistoliers, the scourge of the American West Wild Bill Hickok, who I just I just uh, don't care for him at all. At one point, the newspapers were calling him the Prince of the Pistoliers, which was a, a heck of a note. But anyway, uh, the Prince of the Pistoliers later on got his uh, back of his skull uh, plowed with a, a thirty-five, a thirty-eight, uh, by a guy that could barely cocked a hammer on a, on a gun, a guy by the name of Broken Nose Jack McCall. So the prince of the Pistoliers was killed by a guy that could just barely cock a hammer on the thing. So anyway, that's Pistoliers. <laughs> okay, I've got to ask now. <laughs> Why don't you like Wild Bill Hickok? <laughs> oh, it's... Uh, I studied him a little bit, but I never wanted to write a book on him or anything like that. But I read 
a lot of different accounts and everything. And, and the pulp writers and the, the newspaper writers made him a m- mythological figure. And he was really not that. He would back shoot somebody if he got a chance. And he didn't do stand-up gunfights too often. Now, he did sometimes, but like that deal about him walking out in front of that saloon and, and uh, hitting uh, Phil Cole with those two Derringers. I mean, that was typical of him and everything. And it is known that he was a syphilitic uh, from his earlier days of carousing, which he continued on. And the effects of uh, syphilis in the tertiary stage is your mind kind of goes wacko and your vision goes bad and so that that was what was happening uh let's see when he killed phil cole and then later on when he's in deadwood and he got killed there so I, I, the, the readings i've done on him of course there's always all of that pulp writer and media of the day that adored him and just said wonderful things about him. In the book, The Texas Pistoliers, Ben Thompson's lawyer wrote a book about Ben Thompson shortly after Thompson's death. And the lawyer described Wild Bill Hickok much different than what the newspapers did and what a terrible person he was and everything. So it's from reading a lot of stuff and not believing a lot of the hype that the pulp writers and the newspapers of the day were saying. One of the things I want to tell you is that um, a lot of Western historians, they have the ones that love Hickok and then the ones that despise him. So it's not a a done deal. It's, It's which slant you take. One of the characters that continue to pop up in your book, and I think someone who really seemed to be a constant Achilles heel for Ben Thompson was his younger brother, Billy, who he had to bail out of trouble over and over again. Oh, yeah. His brother was a heavy drunk all of his life. And he was, like I said there in uh, Ellsworth, Kansas, where he manages to shoot the the sheriff that was trying to help them uh, by accidentally stumbling and hitting the sheriff with uh, buckshot. At one point, if I remember right, Thompson and and Bat Masterson even go to Nebraska to try and rescue Billy. Yeah. No, Ben Thompson did not go with him. Oh, oh, got it. It it was Bat Masterson by himself. The reason Bat went is that Ben Thompson knew if he went up there, he would be lynched. So, because they were going to lynch his brother Billy, so he hired Bat Masterson to go up there and get his brother out. Bat goes up there, and uh, after a period of time, manages to get him out of out of jail, rolled up in a carpet, and he takes the carpet with Billy inside down to the train, and they catch a train out of town. They wind up at North Platte, and when they get off the train, there's nothing open except one saloon. They go to that saloon, and there is none other than Buffalo Bill Cody, heavy in his cups, telling stories and all that sort of stuff. Well, Bat goes in, and he knows uh, Buffalo Bill, and he tells him what has happened, and so... Buffalo Bill, in a grand gesture, said that nothing was going to happen to them, and he would see to it that they got back to Texas safely. So they went out to Buffalo Bill's ranch, and the next morning they got a a buggy, and they joined Buffalo Bill Cody, who was taking taking some uh, European aristocrats out to show them the Wild West and stuff. And the, what happened in that, I mean, the, the, this, this thing just goes on. They, it was an entourage, you know. Uh, they had, everybody was on horses except Bat Masterson and, and Billy Thompson. And they go along for about 15 or so miles. And then it's time for 
refreshments, and they all take a bunch of shots of brandy or whatever, and wait around a little bit and start up again, and and then they stop for refreshments sooner and sooner, and finally, Buffalo Bill Cody was so drunk he couldn't stay on his horse, and so they had to throw him in the back of another wagon that was long, and they threw him in the back of that, and they were then they kept on going, and finally that uh, wagon overturned and threw uh, Buffalo Bill Cody out and uh, banged him up a bunch. But anyway, he said, go on and go and uh, stay safe, basically. So from that point on, they head toward Kansas, and they, just a little bit later after they started their buggy trip, it started raining on them, and it was cold and rainy and just pitiful, and they threw a buffalo robe over Billy, and they rode in that heavy rain, cold rain, until they got into Kansas, and they pulled into a town, and and the the first thing that Bat Masters wanted was a hot bath and a good meal, and Billy said, no, no, take me to the telegraph office. I'm going to telegraph the sheriff in Nebraska and tell him I'm in Kansas City it may have been I'm not sure I'm in Kansas City come and get me and so he had to stop Billy staggered into the telegraph office and sent the wire <laughs> so White Earp was there any kind of relationship between White Earp and Ben Thompson that we know of not to any real significance Thompson was involved on a peripheral level in some of the shenanigans that uh, White Earp was involved with uh, when he was the sheriff of Tucson. And yet, no, they never had really a lot of interaction. Didn't White Earp claim at some point in his later life that he'd arrested Ben Thompson? Yeah, I'd forgot about that part. Yeah, there was a guy that really he did a promotion piece book on uh, White Earp. Uh, the, the author's last name was Lake. Anyway, it was a whole fluff piece how, how wonderful White Earp was. In that shootout in Ellsworth that I was telling you about, where Billy shot the sheriff, after Billy took off on a horse. White Earp says he said that he went and took the rifle uh, away from Thompson. He said that, and that's what Lake put in his book. But there is no other, that was not recorded by anybody else. So I think, in my opinion, that was strictly a a made-up story. Yeah, there are a lot of things that have been embellished about White Earp over the years, haven't there? not a good guy. You know, all of the uh, movies made about the shootout at the OK Corral, he's romantic, he's this and he's that, he's one all. He wasn't that a way. He was a terrible guy. At one point, before he went out to Tucson and everything, he was selling lead bars painted gold, and he was selling them for gold bricks. I mean, and he was involved in prostitution back uh, east. And he was involved in all kinds of... Then once all of the OK Corral stuff goes through, where he shot and killed a lot of people in cold blood, he went out to uh, California with uh, Josephine, and they went out there, and he was running gambling stuff out in uh, California. And then they went up to uh, Nome, Alaska, and ran gambling up there. And then they came back to, to California... And they had blown through all of his money and all of her money. She, Her family gave her a lot of money, and they had blown through it all. So at the time of his death, he, he did not have very much money. But he was not what you would call an upstanding uh, citizen. Hmm. Let's shift to Kingfisher. Um, we don't want to gloss over him. His background differed quite a bit from Thompson's. He was a native son of Texas, right? Correctly. In contrast to Ben Thompson, who was a frontier gambler, King Fisher was a 
cattle rustler, and he killed a number of people. Each one of them, he said, was trying to kill him. So every time when he killed somebody, it was uh, either the other person or Fisher was going to go down. He came to the thing called the Nueces Strip. I lived inside the Nueces Strip as a boy. And it was a wild section of Texas at that time. And they had a lot of cattle rustling. So he came in as a young man. Uh, I think he was about 19 when he got there. And they hired him for a as a stock marshal. And what his job was was to hunt down the cattle rustlers and stop them, which usually interpreted that mean kill them. And he was good at it. And he did... He killed a number of men who were cattle rustlers. And then uh, after a while, he got enough money, and he, opened, he had his own ranch on the Pendentia Creek, which was about 20 miles away from where I grew up as a kid. And he had a ranch stronghold out there, and he started rustling himself. So he turned from stock marshal to stock rustler, and he rustled cattle and horses and all of that on both sides of the border and was a close friend of Porfirio Diaz, who later on became the president of Mexico. And he was a a really um, prolific rustler. He dressed in real flashy clothes, using a lot of the Mexican style of dressing and everything. He was a very uh, handsome guy. He had a, a black mustache and a, he had beautiful head of black hair very attractive to the women the women thought he was nifty and so he was soft spoken he he was very quiet uh, quiet most of the time but when he talked he was soft spoken and he really was a pleasure to be around if you weren't pointing a gun at him type of thing and so eventually after several years of rustling and stuff the governor of Texas sent down uh, Leander McNally, the Texas range captain, and his men to clean up the New Aces Strip and bring law and order to the lawless area there. And they went down there, and uh, it took a while before they finally were able to capture Kingfisher at his ranch stronghold. Immediately when they approached him, he took off his gun belt and he handed it to the ranger captain and he said and so the ranger captain took him into uh, Eagle Pass and there in Eagle Pass they threw him in jail and then quickly uh, a lawyer for Kingfisher arrived at the jail and they started bickering about the authority to throw Kingfisher in jail and after a while the lawyer was able to beat down Leander McNelly into letting him go. So he walked out of that jail a free man. Then a little while later, uh, Kingfisher and uh, Leander McNelly crossed paths. And uh, McNelly says, you were lucky this time, but if there's another time, I'm going to kill you. You better change your ways. And so Kingfisher says, okay, that's fine. Well then, shortly after all that episode, Leander McNelly died of consumption, and one of his lieutenants, a guy by the name of Joe Armstrong, uh, who was known as Leander McNelly's bulldog, he goes in, and they're going to capture Kingfisher and his men down on a lake called the Espantosa Lake that has alligators in it, and it was a swampy place. Now, can you imagine that down in Texas, a swampy place like, but it was. And uh, so they go down and, and and approach the camp at night, and his order his orders were just kill as many as you can, you know, type thing. They have a big, massive gunfight down there at night on on the campsite where the rustlers were fixing their supper, and they kill a number of people, um, but Kingfisher was not there, so he was not there at the time, so they missed him. Then later on, another lieutenant by the name of Red Lee, he goes down and eventually captures King Fisher, throws him in in, uh, jail, and then starts the period of trying to 
bring all the murder charges against him and all the rustling charges against him. And at that point, Kingfisher hires a top-notch defense lawyer by the name of T.T. Teal, T-E-E-L. And at the time when he hired him, there were several murder charges against Kingfisher, and there were half a dozen rustling charges against him. Well, over the period of about a year and a half to two years, Teal was able to get all of those charges dropped. In one particular one where he was supposed to have uh, killed someone and rustled some cattle, uh, when they had the trial, it came time for the trial, and so they show up for the court, and the judge says, well, where's the witness, uh, the rancher, you know, that brought the charges and everything. So the deputy sheriff has to say, well, we went out to his ranch and we couldn't find him. We don't know what happened to him. He took off. So immediately T.T. Till said, motion to acquit, and the judge says, done. (laughs) So they intimidated witnesses. They did all kinds of stuff. But after all of that, uh, eventually Kingfisher had all those charges dropped against him. About this time, he had had his wife, Sarah had had a couple of, of girls, and they were living in on the Peninsula Creek Ranch and also in uh, Eagle Pass. So his wife comes to him and says, uh, King, we've got to stop all this n- nonsense, and we got to get out of here, and we got to do because we've got daughters, and we can't be living this way. So he sells all of his uh, business interests that he had there in Eagle Pass, plus his ranch on the Pendentia, and they move to Uvalde, Texas. Once he gets to Uvalde, the sheriff of Uvalde County offers him the job of the deputy sheriff. And at first he doesn't want to do it, no. But then they keep working on him and finally says, okay, I'll take the job if I can run for the sheriff in the coming November election. And so the sheriff says, that's fine. And so they sign him on as the deputy sheriff of Uvalde County. Well, just a short time later, the sheriff, by the name of Boatwright, takes off with a bunch of the county money and heads to California. So King Fisher becomes the acting uh, sheriff of Uvalde County. And And being that, He took on some of the baddest of the bad in the area, and the people of Uvalde just thought he was terrific. One of the things that that he did do was to take on the terrible Hannah Hands. It was a family, mother, father, and several kids, grown kids, that were just bad to the bone. Everything about them was criminal, everything. Well, two of the brothers robbed a stagecoach and got away with a strong box full of money. And so Fisher and another guy go out to the ranch to get the rest of the uh, brothers and bring back the cash. They had a big, massive gunfight out there, and one of the sons was killed, and they brought back the strong box full of money. And that just thrilled the people of Uvalde immensely to take on the terrible Hannah Hands. And it was uh, the mother who was so evil. She was bad to the bone. She was way past that. But anyway, later on in in, uh, Kingfisher's life, she would become a major figure. So after all of that, it was while he was uh, working as the acting sheriff of Uvalde County They had a change in uh, uh, the fence rules uh, of cattle and stuff. It was where you couldn't cut fences and barbed wire and all that sort of stuff. The the legislator passed a bunch of real stringent laws involving fence cutting. So Kingfisher went to Austin to get updated on all those and find out all what needed to be done. And then when he was through with the stuff there at the Capitol, he went down to 6th Street, well, which, which was 6th Street today, but I, Pecan, I think, is it, what it was at the, in those days, and hunts up uh, Ben Thompson. They had had a, a number of times where they crossed paths, but nothing 
major. They didn't really do that much, weren't around each other that much. So then he goes down there and uh, takes uh, Thompson over to the Crystal Bar where they have a number of drinks, and eventually he convinces Ben Thompson to go on the train with him back to San Antonio, and they were going to see a performance at the Turner Opera House. East Lynn was the name of the performance. And so they travel by train down to San Antonio. While they're traveling on the train, Thompson's just drinking up a storm, and he is skunk drunk when he gets off of the train there in San Antonio. Anyway, they get in a, a hack and go down to the Turner Opera House, see the performance, and they're drinking it at, at intermission and all that sort of stuff. So both of them had had a lot of alcohol. And then uh, when the performance is over with, they take another hack and they go over to the Vaudeville Theater and Saloon, which was previously owned by Jack Harris. Now is being managed by Billy Sims and Joe Foster, who had sent word to, to Ben Thompson that if he ever poked his head into the Vaudeville Theater and Saloon, they would kill him. So Thompson and Fisher arrive at the Fogville. They go through the doors, go up to the bar, and order drinks. In a little bit, up comes Billy Sims. And then Billy Sims, they talk for a while, and it looks like that they've got a truce going on. And so he invites them upstairs to the balcony to watch the theater down below. And while they're up there, they have more drinks, order cigars and everything. It's a jolly good time. Uh, a um, private duty policeman comes over by the name of uh, Jacobo, and they are all sitting there drinking and having a jolly good time. And then Ben Thompson spies Joe Foster at another table and motions for him to come over. And he says, let's let bygones be bygones and so forth. And he extends his hand to Joe Foster and Joe Foster won't accept it and says that he wants to be okay, not friends, but he was okay, but he didn't want to shake his hand. And Thompson was found that to be very rude, and he starts cursing him and slaps him. And then he pulls his pistol out and tries to shoot him, but Jacobo managed to grab a hold of his gun and uh, put his thumb in between the hammer and where it would strike the back of the gun. And so they have a brawl. And then after a, a short period of time, all of the people in the saloon back away from Ben Thompson and King Fisher. And then three gunmen behind a wooden, wooden lattice shoot and kill Ben Thompson and King Fisher. And then that is the end of them that night. That was done in front of a room full of witnesses, but no one was ever convicted for the murder of Ben Thompson and King Fisher. And you might just want to say, why? Well, like I said earlier, it was in San Antonio. Thompson had killed the political boss of the Democratic Party. And as it is mm, surmised that uh, King Fisher was at the wrong place for the wrong time with the wrong man and was just killed in a bunch of shots being shot from behind the wooden screen. And it was Billy Sims that set all that up, and Billy was never uh, convicted or anything, and he went on to live another 20-some-odd years, something like that, and he died of a ruptured appendix in San Antonio. So he got away with the orchestrated murder of Ben Thompson and King Fisher. So that's how King Fisher eventually wound up with Thompson in the Vaudeville Theater. And it's thought, a you know, speculation, I read this different ways to different people, and I think I concur with it. It is thought that King Fisher was going to try to broker a deal between Thompson and Billy Sims.
and that was his purpose of, t- of them going over to the Vaudeville Theater that night. But apparently uh, that didn't work out like he had hoped. And in the autopsy, uh, both men had uh, shots to the head with uh, powder marks. So after all the shooting had stopped, Billy Sims or Joe Foster went over with a gun and put the fatal shot in both of them. And it's thought that King Fisher was just caught up in all the gunfire, but they had to go on ahead and kill him so that he couldn't testify against them. And that's one of the presumptions that was made. So basically, Sims and Foster believed that Thompson had murdered Jack Harris in cold blood, and this was their opportunity to get their revenge. Payback time. Uh, Yeah, that's right. Um, You know, even though uh, Jack Harris fired the first shot as a shotgun blast, and he fired the first shot, but then, of course, Thompson standing out in the street nailed him and he died. Well, not right away. He actually lived for uh, a period of time and then died. So this was payback time. Billy Sims and Joe Foster. I wanted to ask you, um, what were the differences in gunfighting styles between King Fisher and Ben Thompson? Both men claimed that they never killed anybody that wasn't trying to kill them. That is what both of them claimed. But Thompson had a unique ability to goad a lot of times his opponent into drawing his gun. And then once he, once the opponent drew his gun, uh, Thompson shot and killed him. King Fisher, in a different mode, always swore that the other people were shooting first and it was either him or them. And so uh, it was slightly different. He didn't do the goading and stuff that Thompson did. Fisher used both his his right and left hand, right? Yeah. He was, uh, that was one of the things, one of the rangers of that time said that he was one of the true two pistol shooters. And that is a trick to be able to shoot two guns, a gun in each hand. Thompson never did that. He was always a one gun person. But supposedly, according to what was written by that Texas Ranger, that uh, King Fisher could do that. He could shoot with either hand or both at the same time. How many deaths do you attribute to each of them? Numbers are a funny thing when it comes to this sort of stuff. Oh, it's speculated. You know, the high numbers are in uh, on King Fisher are up in the couple of dozen. Uh, on Thompson, a dozen or so. But numbers were, you couldn't really pin a lot of that stuff together to make sure. It was, after reading all that, after doing all the research, my guess is probably about a half a dozen men for both of them, maybe a little bit more for King Fisher. But uh, body count really wasn't it. It was how effective they were. And at the time, both men were known as the most feared pistol fighters in Texas. And so everybody knew these guys were good with guns, and you didn't face them holding a gun. So body count is kind of a nebulous thing to try to nail down. What was the public's reaction to the vaudeville theater ambush? The people in uh, San Antonio were elated because this was the big payback. The people in Austin were horrified with it. So the newspapers in Austin quoted eyewitnesses that said that Thompson and Fisher were mutilated by men standing behind a wooden blind. The San Antonio papers told it another way, where it, you know, it wasn't them. And so between the people in San Antonio and the people in Austin, there was a big gulf in between
between the way they saw that. And it that went on in the San Antonio papers and the Austin papers and then other papers across uh, Texas that went on for three or four months about how the assassination was uh, carried out. So it depended on where you lived as to whether you thought it was a tragedy or if you thought it was good riddance type of thing. Do you think this could have all been avoided if Ben Thompson hadn't been so drunk and aggressive? Or do you believe it would have happened irregardless? No, I think it was, I really attribute it to Thompson's um, drunkenness. But by the time when all that happened, remember, he had been on drunken binges and a bunch, and he was belligerent and everything, and he just decided that uh, he could do all this. And so I lay the whole blame on Thompson. Kingfisher, hopefully, or I don't know hopefully, but probably was trying to broker the deal. There was some speculation, and this is way off track, but I did see it, that Fisher and Thompson had a run-in a couple of years prior, and it was speculated that he lured Ben Thompson into the Vaudeville Theater that night so that Thompson could be killed. I don't agree with that at all, but that was one of the speculations that was going on at that time. Interesting. Huh. These two men haven't become the iconic Old West figures that men like Wyatt Earp, uh, Wild Bill Hickok, Jesse James, and others have. Why is that, do you think? Well, first of all, it was just the whims of the newspapers of the day and the pulp writers. They picked their ones that they wanted to make mythological figures out of. And Thompson didn't qualify. They did. They didn't. He, you know, he was a Texas gambler. What did they care about him? Uh, he wasn't uh, like some of the others that they made mythological figures. And King Fisher, other than just in Texas, he wasn't known about. Nobody really cared about a rusher down in uh, South Texas that had killed some people. And uh, rustled a bunch of cattle. They didn't care. So both of them slid into the historical ash bin, and after that, they weren't really... There would be tales about them in bar rooms and around campfires for a number of years, a lot of them tall tales and stuff. But then after a generation or so, nobody knew who they were. And that's the way it stood. That's the way it stood until that day when I was a teenager, and they moved Kingfisher's coffin from one location to the other. We didn't get a chance to talk about John Wesley Hardin. The list of names that Ben Thompson rubbed shoulders with is really extensive. Yeah, uh, he was um, friends with Ben Thompson, um, and matter of fact. John Wesley Harden said that Thompson tried to hire him to kill Wild Bill Hickok, but he refused. But uh, now John Wesley Harden was a whole other animal, and he did kill whenever he wanted to kill. It didn't make any difference whether you were shooting at him or not. And he had a really wild life, too. But th- they knew each other. And there is some accounts where he talks about stuff, but you don't know. Um, while while um, he was in prison, he wrote his own auto- autobiography, and in that is where he talks about that meeting with Thompson. So, Texas Pistoliers, the true story of Ben Thompson and Kingfisher, available online, available in bookstores, and people can go to your website as well. Correct. What, what What is your website? What is the URL? It's grwilliamson.com. My initials are GR. So it's grwilliamson.com. And what will people find there? Well, they'll see uh, a little bit about me. 
they'll see a little bit about the books I've written. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the, the uh, I need to do some have some work done on the website because it doesn't include some of my latest books and stuff. Uh, I just got through publishing a book called um, Death of a Con Man about uh, the notorious Soapy Smith, uh, who was killed in 1898 in Skagway, Alaska. And let's see, there's a, another book about a petticoat dealer by the name of uh, Lottie Denno that uh, roamed the West and never used her real name. Lottie Denno was a nickname that was applied to her, and she started using the nickname. And that, it, the title of that one is uh, Lottie Denno, the Mysterious Hellcat of the West. Uh, petticoat dealers are women, pharaoh dealers, 21 dealers, were called Hellcats. And so that was the reason for the title. I'm working now on a book on, uh, and once again, I write about stuff that you don't normally see. Uh, so I, I don't write books on Billy the Kid, uh, Jesse James and all of that sort of stuff. That's been overwritten so much. Uh, the one I'm working on will be, st- actually I'm starting um, literally tomorrow, on uh, George DeVoe, uh, the Mississippi uh, riverboat gambler, card sharp and scam artist. And his life is fascinating. He made millions during his lifetime. But he lost it all along the way, and he died almost penniless and everything. But it's going to be a hoot to write. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking for. I, I enjoy writing stories that are fun. Uh, he wrote a book about himself, an autobiography, and it's the most. It's a fun read because he is fabricating as he goes along and everything. But I'm going to quote some of his uh, own words in the book from that from that book that he wrote, and then I'm going to give you a historically accurate narrative in between to tell you the real story of what's going on. So my website eventually is going to show a lot of that, but right now it hadn't been updated. One more quick thing, Uh, Eric. I've often thought that the killing of Ben Thompson and Kingfisher at the Vaudeville Theater, that episode would make a Cracker Jack movie. It would take a skilled screenwriter to be able to, you know, put the story together and everything. But in the vein of um, Bonnie and Clyde, where the central characters are all killed, you know, are killed at the end, we, it, this would be done the same way, where the central characters are are killed. It could be told. The cinematic story could be told through the eyes of uh, Billy Sims who got away with their murders. So it's, I've always hoped that somewhere down the line somebody would pick that up and try to make a movie out of it. Because I think it would be, if, if it was done right, uh, in in uh, movies about historical events, I'm always satisfied if it's a 60-40 story. 60% historically accurate and 40% Hollywood. Now, a lot of them are 50-50 and then also the reverse of that. They just There's no real historical accuracy in the story at all. So one day I hope that somebody will pick that up and say, hey, this will make a movie. Yeah, even better than a movie, uh, Thompson's story would make a great television show. Yeah. He had so many run-ins with well-known period lawmen and outlaws. Lots and lots of great material. You're right. So who knows? Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but I think it would make a good one. Let me close with one thing here. At one point, uh, Kingfisher was in jail in Medina County, Texas, and a deputy sheriff there by the name of Tom Sullivan, Sullivan, excuse me, Tom Sullivan, is quoted as saying this. They call Kingfisher and Ben Thompson bad men. But they wasn't bad men. They just wouldn't stand for no foolishness, and they never killed anyone unless they bothered them. <laughs> so that was his, basically, that, that could be the epitaph to 
uh, Fisher and Thompson, that they wasn't bad men. <laughs> oh, okay, you you brought this up, um, the epitaph. Yeah. This was one of my favorite parts of your book, um, this marble tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell that story? Yeah, oh, that's a great story, yeah. And uh, I, I, I sourced that through a number of sources, and it, it seemed... There may be some variation in it, but it really did happen. Okay, he's playing uh, in in the Iron Front Saloon in his gambling parlor upstairs. He's playing poker with some guys. And this and is Ben Thompson. Ben Thompson, I'm sorry. Ben Thompson, yeah. They're up there in the, above the Iron Front Saloon, and they're playing poker. And in comes a tombstone salesman. And he asked if he can sit in. Thompson says, sure, pull up a chair. And they so they're playing, and very quickly, Thompson cleans out the tombstone guy. And, you know, he's, he's having to leave the game because he has no money. But he offers Thompson a marble tombstone that was worth at least $200 to stay in the game. And at first, Thompson said, I don't think I want that. But then he says, hold on. He said, could you bring that up here to us? So the tombstone man has to go down, go down to the wagon that he had, and took some other people with him to bring that marble tombstone upstairs to set it on the floor to let Thompson see it. And Thompson says, okay, I'll front you 200 for that. And so they start playing again, and very quickly the tombstone man lost all of his money. Well, Thompson thought he was kind of funny and everything, and, and so the before he, the tombstone man left, he said, uh, Ben, why don't you let me inscribe that for you? And uh, Thompson said, no, I, I, wait, I want to wait till I've actually done something important. So he just had a marble slab, and that was all. Well, T- Thompson kept that around for fun, and he would make jokes about it and everything. Everybody look at the his tombstone. Then eventually they moved it down to the basement uh, of the iron front and stored it way back up in a corner. And then later, everybody forgot where it was. Then Thompson is dead, and they want to find that tombstone, and they can't find it. They don't know where it is. Everybody had forgotten. So they had to get a different tombstone, and it, today, if you look at, if you go up to the uh, cemetery in Austin, you can see that tombstone. But it was, it's not the grand tombstone that Thompson had gotten from the tombstone man. It, it, it was a much simpler stone. But if you go up there, you can see it. And um, today, if you go up there and find it, it's difficult to find in that cemetery up there. When you come upon it, you're looking at rows and rows and rows of um, grave markers and, and uh, tombstone stuff, and finally you come to his tombstone. And there are no other tombstone around him for a good 20 feet on all directions. A single tombstone there. It's underneath a, a large oak tree. And um, you know, that's what's there. And it's interesting, nobody was buried around him. His wife had a cemetery plot there, and she is with her family, but none of, nobody was buried next to Ben Thompson. And they eventually found that marble slab years and years later, you, you wrote. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that part. Yeah, uh, later on when they're tearing all that down to make room, they're tearing the building down and everything, they happened to be down in that basement, cleaning out the basement before they tore it down, and there it was the marble, the missing marble tombstone. And I don't know what happened to it after that, but that yeah, you're right. They did find it later on. Well, this has been a treat. Thank you so much for your time. Well, I, I hope that I shed a little light on those two lesser-known people of the American West, and I, I hope that uh, people might want to find out a little bit more about them. Again, I've been speaking to G.R. Williamson, author of Texas Pistoliers, the true story of Ben Thompson and King Fisher. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobweb corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, 
and have a safe tomorrow.